Are you tired of being stuck behind the computer? Constantly staring at a blank page and searching for the next great story idea? It's time to break free from the constraints of screenwriting and discover a world of endless possibilities. Quitting your screenwriting career can seem daunting, but it's also an opportunity to pursue your passions and live life to the fullest. So why not take the leap and say goodbye to the monotony of screenwriting and hello to a world of excitement and adventure? Join us on Quitting Your Screenwriting Career Podcast, where we share inspiring stories from individuals who have made the bold decision to leap behind their screenwriting careers and embark on new and exciting journeys. Whether it's starting a business, traveling the world, or simply finding a new hobby, we'll provide you with the tools and the resources you need to make your first steps towards a happier, more fulfilling life. So if you're ready to make the leap and quit, Tune in to Quitting Your Screenwriting Career Podcast and let's start this new adventure together. Five, four, three, two, one. Um, if you want to do it that way, or you can just, you can, I can clap. <laughs> we have to, oh yeah, but that's why we count down together. If we count we down together. We have to count down together. Okay, yeah, let's count so down together. Okay, Where ready? We, yeah. From five. From five. five? Okay, <laughs> this is okay, like when you... I bungee jumped. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, start okay. again. Okay, from five. Five. Five? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Five, four, four three, three, two, two one. Are you small words that you'll be sure to understand, you warthog-faced buffoon? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. What did you say? You are a sad, strange little man. Don't call me stupid. Hello and uh, welcome to The Best Bits, a movie podcast where each week we pick our favourite scenes from randomly selected, weirdly specific themes. This is your co-host Kevin Leanne, a writer of one and a bit films and three and a bit episodes of TV. And I'm joined for the very first time by my co-host and writer of three films plus a Christmas special, Will Collins. Hello, Kevin Leanne. Um, <laughs> we're doing this, Kevin. We're doing this. Yeah. We're doing it. You know what? Isn't it great to be like pioneers in the podcast scene? Like, you know, you know, just to create the world's first podcast. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and excited and I really don't know what is, what's ahead of us. Um, what are we doing, Kevin? Who are we? What are we doing? We're, we're, we're coming into this racket about 10 years too late, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's lockdown and, you know, everybody's sort of starting a podcast and why not us? Why not? Yeah. So Kevin, hey. Who are we? What's the story? Who are what? Where are you? Who who the hell are you, Kevin? How do you answer that? Who am I? I'm a screenwriter. Where are you from? I'm from Cork. Wasn't born there, but I was brought up there. Um, and I've just been a screenwriter as as long as I can remember, and wanted to get into movies as long as I can remember. But I wrote one film called Grabbers, and um, I've also done some TV. I wrote uh, an anthology series that was based on Neil Gaiman's work um, that came about two years ago. And that those are my sort of produce credits, but I've been working consistently for the last ten years. So I'm a, a screenwriter and a film fan. What about yeah. you? I uh, I I too am from Cork, and um, I say you might can you can probably tell it more from my accents, even though waivers, even though I have I have a country accent. But you see, I haven't lived in Cork for since 1998 or 1997, as a matter of fact. So I have this like mongolized accent, but like the Cork is still there. When I talk to people up here, I live in Donegal now, and they just say to me, oh, yeah, you're from Cork. Yeah. And I'm like, how could you tell? How is that possible? Um, but yeah, I'm a screenwriter as well. I, you might most noticeable films are um, most recently uh, Wolf Walkers for Cartoon Saloon. I also wrote Song of the Sea with Cartoon Saloon. And my first uh, uh, feature was a film called My Brothers, which was a kind of a low budget Irish independent film seen by very few people. I think five people on Letterboxd um, like it. (laughs) And what's the Christmas special? I wrote a Christmas special called Angela's Christmas. I co-wrote a Christmas special called Angela's Christmas and that's uh, on Netflix. This week, the topic uh, that we decided to, to sort of land on, which would be a little bit more um, easygoing on both of us, seeing as this is our dummy episode, essentially. And that's favourite scene from a favourite writer. Yes. And I what, and what we're going to do is Kevin's going to... I don't know what Kevin's scene is and Kevin doesn't know what my scene is. So we're kind of looking forward to... I'm looking forward to 
uh, hearing what your pick is. Well, I had a whole other different writer in mind. And then I started to look back through their, their films and watch a lot of their films and sort of fill myself in on the, the blind spots. And I changed my mind. But the writer that I did end up picking, um, he was in a poll recently uh, that Vulture did. And he came in at number six. And he came in behind um, Billy Wilder, the Coen brothers, Robert Town, Tarantino and Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, to give you some more clues, because I want to see if you can guess it. Um, He's in the Hall of Fame, the WGA Hall of Fame, three times with three different scripts. Uh, He's a novelist, an essayist, uh, a playwright, a script doctor, and a screenwriting guru. And if he didn't write the Bible on how-to screenwriting, he's definitely written one of the Gospels. And he's won two Academy Awards. He won for Best Adapted Screenplay, and he also won for Best Original Screenplay. Is it William... William Goldman? It is, yeah. <laughs> so, I didn't know that William Goldman had a brother. He had a brother called James Goldman, and his brother won the Academy Award for The Lion in Winter in 1969. And the next year, William Goldman won the Academy Award for Butch Cassidy. He, sorry, he was, his brother was also an Oscar-winning screenwriter. Yep. And the winner is yeah. James Goldman for The Lion in Winter. The winner is... William Goldman for Butch Cassidy. Wow. So, William Goldman, he had a fascinating life. He was born in 1931 in Chicago. His mother was deaf and his dad was a drunk. So you can imagine what that household was like. He wrote his first book in three weeks. Oh my goodness. And that took him into the movies. Once he was in the film business, he was off and running. And uh, he started writing his own original screenplays and he'd been investigating the story of Butch Cassidy for uh, many years up until that point. And he decided to write it as a, a film. You know, he was working with Redford then and Redford brought him in for all the president's men. And they follow the money. I was shocked to learn that uh, if he could do his life all over again, he would write all the same scripts again, except for all the president's men. He, what? Yeah, he did not like the experience he had on that, uh, working for Redford. He wrote more drafts of that script than any other script that he'd ever uh, done in his career, and he just hated it. He wow. didn't like the film, but he won wow. the Oscar for it, so, you know, swings and roundabouts, I guess. Yeah. Um, he's someone who adapted an awful lot of work from other writers, and he did an awful lot of Stephen King um, adaptations. He did Misery, of course, and Dreamcatcher, which... You know, it wasn't the best film, but I would put most of the blame of that on Stephen King's book, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. He adapted his own work as well. He did Marathon Man, which uh, was a novel that he wrote. And, uh, but the film that I chose is uh, the one which he regards as um, the most joyful experience he's ever had writing anything. And I thought when I was looking through all his back catalogue of films that I would have to go with him. And I chose uh, The Princess Bride. Oh wow, that's just that's just fantastic. Grandfather's here. Can't you tell me I'm sick? He'll pinch my cheek. I hate that. Maybe he won't. Hey, how was the sick? Huh? I brought you a special present. What is it? It was the book my father used to read to me when I was sick, and I used to read it to your father. And today I'm going to read it to you. Did you know it was based on a book? I, I suppose most people do, but were you aware of it? Oh, yeah. I knew it was based on a book. I'd never read it. I've never read it because it, was it was it Rob Reiner? Did he read it to his kids or something like that? So I can't remember the genesis of how it became, you know, a screenplay. But yeah. Yeah. So Rob Reiner, um, he started looking for material and he remembered that book. And uh, he reached out to William Goldman and said, you know, would you be interested in, in allowing me to adapt it? And he had no idea that William Goldman had been attempting to have it um, translated into a film for about a decade. But yeah, I read the book and the book is fantastic. It has this narrative device where I guess in the film, right, you've got Peter Falk playing the granddad. And the granddad comes over and he starts telling the story to um, Kevin Arnold from the Wonder Years. Uh, but in the book, William Goldman sort of plays the role of the granddad. So the way that he frames the book is that he creates a fictional version of himself where he pretends to have a son and in reality he has two daughters. And um, he sort of frames it as he found this classic book, this book that was written by S. Morgenstern called The Classic Tale of uh, True Love and High Adventure, The Princess Bride. And he decides to 
um, bring this book to a whole new audience and he's going to cut out all the boring bits and he's going to keep all the good bits. And, um, mm. but it's, it's a, a, a real book and yeah, he sort of plays with the whole thing of like interrupting the, the book to sort of say, well, this section is just, it's all kissing and you don't want to hear about that. And I'm going to cut this out. And, um, this was a great chapter, but it's actually kind of dull. And if anybody wants to read this chapter, you can, uh, send a letter to the publisher and we'll send you the actual chapter, but I've left it out of this because it's, <laughs> it's really sort of, um, it, it's, it's tedious and what have you. And it was all sort of just a flight of fancy. He, he just created this version of himself and then created this fake author to sort of tell this story. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, if for anyone who hasn't seen, uh, the princess bride, it's, it's, it's a lovely little film, but it's a swashbuckling fairy tale about a farmhand who, um, becomes a pirate, uh, named Wesley, and he embarks on a quest to rescue his true love, the betrothed Princess Buttercup from the dastardly, wicked uh, King Humperdinck. I love those names. Um, mm. And to think that that film came out of the mind of the guy that did Is It Safe and The Marathon Man and All the President's Men, and yeah, it's uh, that's range. Oh man, it is. You can just... You can actually feel him, you can feel it being like a relief exercise, you know, to, as a break from writing all that, writing all those um, kind of gritty movies. And the exercise of doing that must have been a great relief and a great joy um, for him. Well, he wrote it for uh, his daughters. His daughters used to come to him and say, Dad, tell me a story. And he said, yeah, okay, well, what kind of story do you want? And they wanted to hear stories about princesses and brides. And so he combined them. <laughs> but... um it was years before I came to that film because of that title. And it was only when I uh, saw a trailer and I saw Andre the Giant was in it that I wanted to see it. But the scene that I went with was uh, to the pain. To the death. No. To the pain. I don't think I'm quite familiar with that phrase. I'll explain and I'll use small words. That when I was a, a kid and I was watching the film, I remember just being completely blown away by the fact that Wesley dies uh, at the beginning of the third act and in comes Billy Crystal with this magic pill coated in chocolate that can bring him back from the, the dead. But when it brings him back, he's completely paralysed. So you've got your hero going in to raid the castle to save the princess and he can't move any part of his body. And so it becomes um, Enio and, and uh, uh, Fezzik carrying him through the, the castle and then plopping him on a bed he cannot move a muscle, but he has to bluff his way into overcoming the villain. And uh, it was such a, a, a clever and fun and a reverent scene. And I just love it. That is what the pain means. It means I leave you in anguish, wallowing in freakish misery forever. I think you're bluffing. It's possible, pig. I might be bluffing. It's conceivable, you miserable, vomitous mass. I'm only lying here because I lack the strength to stand. Then again, perhaps I have the strength after all. That's brilliant. It really is. It's uh, All of these characters just pop in that film. I'm waiting to find a moment to get my kids to watch this one. I'm going to wait another year or two and um, I'm going to spring it on them. Um, but that's a great pick, Kevin. Yeah, William Goldman, man. And he also did a film which doesn't get him as much love as, as I think it deserves, and that's Maverick. I love that film. The Richard Donner Western with Mel Gibson and Jodie Foster, uh, based on the, the James Garner series. Oh. It's such a fun film. You know, I completely forgot that he wrote that. Completely forgot. Jesus, yeah. that was a great, great. <laughs> it's such a romp. Yeah, it really is. Well, you know what? You know what else he did? He wrote 18 unproduced scripts and that I, that is something I think that we both can achieve. <laughs> we're, you're, we're well on the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. That's great. It's a great pick. So that was my pick, but now I want to hear what yours is. Will, what is your favorite scene from your favorite writer? Okay, uh, you, you, you did. You, you really um, showed me up because you truly did your um, homework there. Um, Dude, I it's going to not... be a competition every week and I hope to win <laughs> every time. I will, I will, you know, I can guarantee you're going to win every time. I How I selected my, I just went with my gut and I just thought about um, some of my favourite films and I thought about who made and wrote some of my favourite films and it was a very kind of clear standout. Oh, it's going to be Showgirls again, isn't it? <laughs> how did you know? Damn it. Oh my God. You never stop talking about it. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's always there. Um, uh, so, uh, but I'm going to see if you can guess it, right? Okay. I'm going to give you. So, uh, the, some of the films that um, my choice have um, written include the biographical war drama Unbroken from 2014. The historical legal thriller Bridge of Spies from 2015, and lesser lo- lesser known, commercially unsuccessful comedies such as Crime Wave from 1985, The Naked Man 1998, and Colin Firth's Gambit from 2012. Any idea? I have not seen any of those films, so I have right. no idea. Okay, no, so- I've, seen, I've seen Bridge of Spies. Obviously, that was a good film. Yeah. Um, Crime Wave. Uh, uh, no. I'll give you a couple of more titles. They Don't also please. they also This is wrote, your favorite writer? Yeah. Well, it's a day now, okay? So they also wrote um, Blood Simple, uh Barton Fink, Cudsucker Proxy. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> That's <laughs> Yep. It's... See, I when I picked my guy, he had never directed and I thought it would be a cheat to pick a director. Damn. But um yeah, that that's a great pick. And they came in higher than William Goldman on the the vulture list of top screenwriters. So there you go. Oh, well, that's I just went for like they consistently, you know, are just great storytellers, filmic storytellers. And I know what you mean, I probably should have just gone for the writer, but I just went, "Oh, they're just great screenwriters as well." And the film that I picked from their catalog. The reason I love the reason, first of all, I would say why I love the Coen Brothers so much, and I think they're actually my favorite filmmakers, is because they 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 make what they want to make, whether you like it or not. They're making the film they want to make. They tell stories so unconventionally at times, and they they book trends, and they always. And the weird thing about my relationship with the um, their films is that quite often I come out of their films on my first viewing not particularly liking them like I remember not really liking Big Lebowski the first time I saw it mm. and I remember not really like digging No Country for All Men the first time I saw it um, and I think the same with Miller's Crossing but there, the other thing why about is that their, why do you think that ah, is because I think they are so unconventional they they are breaking the norms. Like I think my kind of like ingrained instinct for classic story structure, not not like a conscious one, but a subconscious level, that it's kind of like they book against it, and uh, as a result, but they're not telling a bad story. What it, what it, what it's creating in me is a sense of curiosity, where I go, "What's going on there?" It's like this. There's a sense of you've done something strange, and I don't know if I don't if I if I like it or not. But when I go back, I go, "Oh, when you kind of when I know what they're actually." what their end goal is, I go back and I enjoy the, um, I enjoy the films uh, uh, more and more. And I just find myself continuously going back to their films over and over again. And like Miller's Crossing is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, uh, you know, The Big Lebowski is just great fun. And No Country for All Men is just astounding in what, what they did, the boldness in their storytelling. And Fargo. Fargo was great. Evan, what you just said is sweet, sweet music to my writer's ears. Because <laughs> the film I'm choosing is, Cohen, is the Coen Brothers' Fargo. It's the Coen Brothers. <laughs> Fargo, the Coen Brothers, the movie. It's the documentary on the Coen Brothers. The movie that I made myself and I wrote a great... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's Fargo. It's Fargo, and here's the trailer. Mr. Lundegaard, you mind if I sit down? Carrying quite a load here. Where's Jerry? Got your damn money. Now where's my daughter? Jeez. Blood has been shed. We now want the entire eighty thousand. I answered the darn. I'm cooperating here. You have no call to get snippled with me. I'm just doing my job here. <gasps> what do you fellas got yourself mixed up in? Police. So, is there anything else you can tell me about him? He wasn't circumcised. Oh yeah. That was a that was a, a clip from the trailer of Fargo. Since I started really getting into this film, it has bugged me so much that commentators on this film have all poo-pooed the the it's the 
high school buddy, not even buddy, someone they knew. And everyone said, well, that yeah, that scene doesn't really, you know, make a lick of sense or it doesn't really add up. If you took that scene out, the film wouldn't work. Is it they're completely, completely wrong? Um, they're completely, it's so critical. But I was like them. I thought that for no, a long man, time. Once, I was like, why are they, what, what's this? The, the design is there. You just have to look at it. You just have to look at it and just watch it as obsessively as I've watched it. Now, the reason I love Fargo <laughs> The reason I love Fargo, and I'll get to my best bit of Fargo. The reason I love it is because Fargo came out in the like ninety six. I'm pretty sure it came out in ninety six, and it was that was in the era in the nineteen nineties, which was dominated by Quentin Tarantino's kind of like um, you know sexy uh, gangsters crime and, and, gangsters, yeah. and it it's, it was there. It glorified and 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 sexified violence and gun violence, and made all these gangsters sexified. Really, that's sexified. A good word. That's good. There you go. Um, but it it kind of irked me as well. It really did bug me. I was like going. I used to think, ah, yeah, okay, these guys, you know, they're shooting me, but you know, ah, you know, fine, it's fun and whimsical to watch. But in 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 Fargo, the criminals. Okay, to give you an idea, the plot of Fargo. I'm sure everyone who's listened to this knows the plot of Fargo. It's like about you know, uh, uh, William H Macy, sniveling car salesman, and he needs money for a, a big business deal. So he plots to have his wife kidnapped and have his father, his father-in-law, pay the ransom, and everything goes wrong. Like as soon as everything ha- starts, it, the kidnap starts to go into motion. It just goes wrong. She uh, falls down the stairs, knocks herself out when they're when they're driving back to their hideout with the 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 wife in the boot in the back seat. I think you know they, <laughs> uh, they they get pulled over and they shoot a cop, and then some other innocent bypassers come by and they, they, the criminals shoot these guys. They're reactionary. They're dumb. The criminals are reactionary and dumb and they're bumbling and they're buffoons. And what I love about it is that in the midst of all that and about unconventionally or kind of our hero of the film appears like not in the thir- first third of the film. She comes in like after the first third of the film's happened and it's like Frances McDormand's heavily pregnant Marge Gunderson and she comes in and she's investigating the crime scene. Now, she's not a super cop, but she's competent and she's good and she's wholesome. She does her job efficiently. Yeah, it had that lovely sort of sequence, didn't they, where they, it would just be her and her husband in bed. You know, but that's what also makes their scripts so wonderful, is that they're so detailed, they're so specific. Like, you know, they, they, they even, like, I read a lot of the script, actually, for this, and it's just a pleasure to read. Um, notoriously, you know, a lot of people, like, you know, it's been said that they, you don't deviate from their scripts, um, and that you, you say exactly what's on the page, but you can see... As it should this, be. This, as it, as it should, nothing should change. But not, but in, but it's not totally true because uh, the scene I'm going to pick is um, is a scene where uh, where Marge Gunderson has kind of followed a, a couple of breadcrumbs. She's not doing intensive, you know, police work, but she's followed uh, followed a couple of bread, uh, breadcrumbs down to Brainerd, which is the city where William H Macy's character is. And um, when she's there, she hooks up with Johnny Wadicky. <laughs> <laughs> Have another go at that, <laughs> Johnny Wanakita. Uh, Johnny Johnny Wanakita. I don't isn't know. Isn't it? Isn't it Mike Yanagi? Yanagi. Mikey Yanagi. Mikey Yanagi. That's it. There yeah. you go. That sounds better. So <laughs> well, she, I got IMDb up here, so I'm cheating. So first of all, she goes in and she has a meeting with William H Macy's character because the cars that the dudes are driving, the criminals are driving, are from his bloody lot. Like you know, there there's a direct link. Okay, so that's a d- dumb criminal plot element number one. And he kind of fobs her off successfully at the first time. But that, uh, so she's, she's already had this, um, meal with Mikey, who's made a pass at her and told her about, you know, told her about like how his wife died and it was his school sweetheart and stuff like that. Now, Marge, then she has his, her first meeting with Jerry, Jerry Lundegaard and she's, she leaves it feeling, okay, this guy's a bit, this guy's a bit ropey or there's something here, but she kind of like puts it to the back of her mind and she's about to leave. She's about to leave her hotel to return to her to uh to her her own home when she rings like one of her her um her uh, people at the base and says oh i met mikey and uh she said oh it's really sad about you know her his wife dying and the woman at the other end of the phone says what are you talking about she's not dead she's married someone else he's full of shit like you know and you can see in that moment the penny drops mm. in marriage gunnerson she goes oh shit and it's like she goes hang on a second he's full of shit and immediately you can see in the performance you can see her thinking that Jerry Lundegaard 
I'm fucking. He's full of shit too. Is I, I something's up with him. And immediately you go, do a hard cut to her going back into the um, Jerry Lundegaard's office. Mr. Lundegaard, sorry to bother you again. Can I come in? Yeah. No, I'm kind of. I'm uh, kind of busy here. I understand. I'll keep it real short then. I'm on my way out of town, but I was wondering. Do you mind if I sit down? Carrying a bit of a load here. No. I... Yeah, it's this vehicle I asked you about yesterday. I was just wondering. Yeah, like I told you, we haven't had any vehicles go missing. Okay. Are you sure? Because, I mean, how do you know? Because the crime I'm investigating, the perpetrators were driving a car with dealer plates, and they called someone who works here, so it'd be quite a coincidence if they weren't, you know, connected. Yeah, I see. So, how do you... Have you done any kind of inventory recently? The car's not from our lot, ma'am. But how do you know that for sure without doing a... Well, I would know... I'm the executive sales manager. Yeah, but I am. And of course, like we with, run a this, with this um, well, how, film, how you know, it opens with the title card of based on a true story, and famously, that's bullshit. But it is actually based on true stories. It is there, like you know, there is a true, there is a case of there was a case in uh, in Minnesota where a husband did kidnap his wife, and there's another case of if you remember uh, one of the early scenes uh, with Jerry Lundegaard where he's trying to sell the true coat to this this couple who've come in for the true coat and uh, who've come in for the car, and he says and he's basically trying to upsell them as the car is being delivered, and the guy is just losing it, but like really politely losing it. That is a true story. That actually literally happened to Ethan Cohn or Joel Cohn like verbatim with some uh, some sales guy tried to pull that number on them and um, I just think that they they litter their stories their screenplays with such specificity that you know I think it's a great lesson for anyone who's writing anything you know it's just, you, if you if you can if you can put in the detail and the texture like that you're darn tootin' so damn important to you I'm sorry, sir. Ah, oh, what the Christ. And what I love about this scene specifically, this is the first time that n- n- juries come under like a pressure from the cops. And what happens, what does he what does he do as a character? He doesn't hold his cool. He just flips. He flips. For, he goes, Fuck, you know, I'm just, I, 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 I'm working with you here. I'm working with you here. And then he's so stupid that when she, he says, I'll go do a count, he just storms out. And that brilliant reveal, like it's so unexpected where she's just sitting there and all of a sudden she sees him driving by and she's going, he's fleeing, he's running. Like it went from like, yeah, um, maybe this guy should be looked at. To, oh my God, he definitely is the guy. <laughs> you know, well, who among a, us hasn't run away from the police? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's an interesting thing. If you look at the script, you know, in that clip that I have there, you know, if you pull up the script, you'll see the deviations that they made from the actual page. And um, there's a couple of, there's one specific ADR, like half a line that they inserted uh, for Marge. But also there's a beat in there. Jerry kind of like kicks uh, kicks out at her, right? And he kind of like says, well, I'm, you know, I'm cooperating here. And she knows that he's he's meaning business and she stands up. And no, that's in, not in the script. She actually, she physically stands up and you can feel, okay, she's making, she's literally changing the tone of this. But then when she, when he leaves to go out and, um, when he leaves to go out and do the car count, she says, she says, oh, can I use your phone? And she immediately, in the script, she immediately starts dialing the, her, her base station to say, oh, there's something suspicious about that. But they change that when in the shoot, in the scene, in the shooting scene. And I'm so glad they did because the payoff, of her just seeing him and the audience seeing Jerry fleeing is so hilarious and 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 brilliant that you know it's just utterly delightful. So um, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that film is delightful. Yeah. Well, I think that's an excellent choice. And um, yeah, so that's the format. But usually, you know, going forward, it would be uh, a different scene theme. So we won't be talking about the same stuff. Um, for a full episode, but uh, jumping around from topic to topic. Um, but now we basically have to figure out what next week's scenes are going to be. And um, mm-hmm. the only way that we could think to do that was to put all these different concepts into a, a, a big wheel and to spin it. And whatever comes up, uh, that will be the scene topic that uh, one of us talks about. So do you want to go first, Will, or will I go first? 
Maybe you go first, Kevin, because I have to pull up my big wheel. <laughs> it's not here in front of me. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. If you can't get it, I can just spin it twice and, and tell you, and I can lie and pick something really awful. <laughs> right, do you want, so are you going to spin for me? Uh, I can, you spin, for, no, I'm, I say we spin for ourselves. Oh, okay, right, go on, okay. No, no, you should spin for me, and tell okay. me, and you okay. tell me what I, what the, the, the topic, that'll be more Okay, of a, all right. I can't cheat that way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Spinning... Best, oh, that's a very easy one. Best Harrison Ford scene. Oh, thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much. Like, oh, God, yeah. I should add an addendum to that where it's not Han Solo, yes. not Indiana Jones. <laughs> you want to know something? Okay, you can easily do that. I'm, I'm easily... I would, nah, just... No, 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 I'm not going that way. I, oh, yeah, this, that's good, that's good. Okay, Kevin, I am spinning for you now. Oh, my God, I can hear it spinning in my ear. And it is coming to a stop. And Kevin, your I'm scared. Your best bits topic for next week is best chase scene. Oh, okay, that's a good one. But that is so open-ended. Yes, there are probably there were probably a thousand chasings. Yes. So the best chasing. Wow. Well, well if you do the same amount of research I do, which is basically. <laughs> Close your eyes for two seconds, and the first the first image that pops into your brain, let that be it. Then it should be easy. Uh, Chariot of Fire. Oh, okay. This is this is a film that's supposed to be about the best bits, Kevin. Okay. Yeah, we're exactly. Got, we're not gonna. We're not gonna keep it positive. Dump, keep keep it positive. positive. Keep it positive. We're not dumping on anything here. Um, so, so there best you go. Bits. So next week, oh, it's like best chase scene for me, and it's best Harrison Ford, Ford scene for you. That'll be fun. You see, this is lovely because you know, in a, in our kind of like cluttered lives, this gives me a kind of a, a lovely little deviation. It gives you purpose. Purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I re- this is definitely the best bit of this show. At the end. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll see you, everyone. Talk to you soon. Right, good luck, thanks. The Best Bits Podcast is produced by Will and Kevin. All audio clips and music heard in this episode is the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders and no infringement is intended. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. If you have any notes, comments, scene suggestions, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at bestbitspodcast at gmail.com. And here is a clip from the lad's latest mini bits bonus show. The full episode, plus 80 more, are available on their Patreon. See ya, Mossy. I gotta go in and record another one of these fucking mini bits. Oh, yes, this is all is messy. I know. <sighs> what are you doing? I, right now, on the Academy screener site. And I hit play because there's only a few films on it for the first month or two. There's only like about less than 10 films on it. And Guy Ritchie's The Covenant is on here. So I hit play on that and I'm hearing all the, we're out in Afghanistan and I'm hearing all the dirt and I hear vehicles and I hear the sound effects of characters walking. But when characters open their mouths, I don't hear any dialogue. Mm -hmm. Oh, they've up- no dialogue. They've uploaded the wrong audio track. It's like that Tom Cruise yeah. trailer where it was just a sound effect. Like, have you met an SP? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this film has been up on the screen site for a few weeks now, and they still have the wrong one here. Well, I tell you what films are actually up there for all Academy members to see, and they see what they've put up Do, there. but first of all, let's just throw to our theme. And I have to say... The feedback from my thank you ballad thank you. was quite fierce. The power of Christ compels you. So I asked Mossy, who is a friend of my dad's at the quiz, sing us a theme tune. Oh. So oh. over to Mossy. <laughs> Hit the cards. I'm fine. I'll get it done from one take. It's the many bits. Oh, my guess what will they say? That's the music playing. 
with Will and Kevin Cox. The best fucking podcast. That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. My God. Thank you, Mossy. You would make an angel weep. That voice would make an angel weep. Tanya. Beautiful. Beautiful. Boolabus. It only cost us two months patron money, so, you know. Is that all? Money well spent, in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, you can't get much for 20 euro. <laughs> <laughs> Will, you were telling me before uh, the intro that you uh, were looking at stuff on the Academy Screeners website. The Academy Awards. So for official members, yes. So how we, they don't send out DVDs anymore. So how you do all your streaming stuff is all via the Academy website. And the streaming season has begun, which is exciting. So it means for the rest of the year. I'm Did it be- ever end? Uh, it does end. It does end after the Academy Awards. There's about two weeks and they <laughs> take all the films down and then they begin again at the end of August and they all start coming up. So it's a whole new collection of hopefuls. So how many films are on there? Right now, about 10. Actually, 10 exactly. I can tell you the 10. Oh, um, Go on, tell me. John Wick 4. For the Oscars. Oh, because there's like... Yes. There's they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Are they adding it in? It's a stunt category being added. I believe they're adding in some sort of stunt category. Breaking news straight from an Academy member's mouth. Because they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Slash film. I don't know. Did I see, read this in an article? I feel they were. They... I felt they were. ...have long overlooked stunts. And my God, it's pure artistry. Yeah. And it is... Incredibly well these days, it's all fucking rubber computer generated avatars. That's why we should hide. That's why pe- these people should be getting their Oscars when yeah. back when someone's actually gone out. Then yeah, go back, back to, absolutely. Go back and give it to your man from Mad Max who broke his legs, and uh, give it to Richard Farnsworth who uh, was a stunt man and was uh, starred in the Straight Story. Yeah, Richard Farnsworth is, was a career stunt man. Oh. Absolutely, wasn't that also mm-hmm. the case with um. Uh, Machete. What's your man, Machete? Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo. Is really? Trejo or Trejo? I always call him Trejo. He just says, call me Danny. <laughs> I was going to say that back to you. Nah. Like, just, uh, <laughs> we were. Because we just call him Danny. 